Now, judging by the hubbub of conversation, I'm sure we're going to have some good questions. Um, I would simply ask you, please make your question a question, not a lecture. Um, so keep it as short as you can, so that as many people as possible can uh, give questions, and so we can give Catherine as much time as possible to give some answers. So let's have some hands up. Who'd like to get the ball rolling? Somebody right at the front here, and somebody over there. We'll maybe take a couple of questions. We'll try and remember them. And then we'll discuss. Anthony, there's one in the front row here, if you want to, to take that. I think it is on. It is now, I think. Yeah. It is now? Yes. Yeah. Hello. Hey, thank you very, very much for that talk. Um, my question was uh, that um, we've seen that there's a lot of evidence that um, human behavior can have a warming effect uh, on our climate. But I just wanted to ask if, if there's any evidence that um, we can cool it, or, um, yeah, if you get, get our drift. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And who's got the mic on this side? Yes. Um, look, doing what you do and speaking about what you speak out and the work that you do, do you feel, how, how do you feel when you look to the future? And how do you find hope if you feel <coughs> overwhelmed by it? Brilliant. So two very different questions there. One on we know we can affect things in a negative way, can we affect things in a positive way as well? And uh, actually a related question in a way about hope. So over to you. So let me answer your question first because I would say that is one of the most common, most frequent questions I get is what gives you hope? And to be perfectly honest, the science does not give me hope. We just published this big climate science report and the last chapter, which is one of the chapters I wrote, talks about the potential for surprise. And when it talks about surprise, it does not mean happy birthday surprise. <laughs> the majority of the surprises that we expect are negative surprises. And again and again, new changes that are happening in the system show us that things are happening faster and or to a greater extent than we thought. The science does not make me hopeful. It keeps me up at night. But we need hope. Because if we feel that it is a giant problem that we can never solve, that is a self-fulfilling prophecy. Where do I look for to hope? I look to two places. One, I look to people. When I talk to people, when I look for stories about what people are doing, I find amazing hopeful stories. You are not alone. I am not alone. There are hundreds of thousands and even millions of people around this world doing amazing things affecting change in their community to help people who are poor and downtrodden, to work on critical issues that are being exacerbated by a changing climate, to help the transition from the, the ways that we've been getting energy since the 1700s to the new clean energy economy. There is hope when we look at what people are doing in the world. And the second thing that I look to for hope is my faith. God is the God of hope. God is not the author of fear. He's the provider of hope. In him, we know that all things are possible. And so while things may look bleak, while it may look darkest before the dawn, so to speak, I know that things can happen that I have no conception of, that I have no idea of, but what I can do is I can put my trust in God and figure out, you know, things could be really bad, they could get really bad, I can, all I can do is do the best that I can, walk in the works that he's prepared for us in advance, and put my hope in him because that's ultimately where it lies. And so that is why my faith is so important to me. Um, but that is also why people are so important, too. In this, in this age, we're becoming increasingly almost disconnected from each other. And that's why it's so wonderful to come together in person here tonight and to be able to realize that we're not alone. There are many of us, and we do care, and together we can make things change. So to answer your question, to make things change, <laughs> can we cool down the planet? Um, the answer is yes, with an asterisk. We could potentially cool the planet by engineering it. And that's something called geoengineering, the idea of engineering the entire planet. Now that might sound a little bit risky. It is. Some geoengineering can be quite simple and quite safe though. Did you know that tree planting is a form of geoengineering? Because it sucks carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. There is the first 
carbon negative power plant in the world, in Iceland now, that is taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and turning it into stone. If we could suck enough carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, we could stabilize those levels at exactly the right level to halt the warming, but to not go into another ice age. And that would be great, but it is expensive. And I'll tell you what is going to be cheaper is to mimic the effect of a really big volcanic eruption, which spews a lot of soot and dust and ash into the stratosphere, to mimic that by putting a lot of soot and dust particles up in the upper atmosphere that act as an umbrella to reflect the sun's energy away. That would be cheaper. But once you put it up there, there is no giant vacuum cleaner to take it back out. And we've never done this before. And if we know one thing for sure, it's that when we do something to our entire planet, we don't know all the effects that it will happen. When we have really big volcanic eruptions, we tend to have famines. Because all that soot and dust blocks the energy from the sun that the plants need to grow. And even though it would be able to stabilize temperature, if we stopped doing it, because those particles only last for so long, if we stopped, temperature would rise very abruptly in a matter of years back up to where it would have otherwise been, and that would be worse than it was in the beginning. Not only that, but it does nothing to affect the fact that all of this carbon dioxide, much of it, about 40% of it, is going into the ocean, or is it is acidifying the ocean. And even though we could, we could regulate the temperature of the planet, we would still see impacts on our hydrological cycle, on our water, on our precipitation that would not be mitigated. So that type of geoengineering is like giving every single human on the planet the same experimental drug at the same time. A drug that we cannot get out of our systems for a couple of years. But at the same time, I think we need to study it because the greater danger is that somebody will do it. I would be fine if people wanted to experiment with sucking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. It's hard not to do that safely. Anybody can do it. They're welcome to. But mimicking the effects of a volcano, that stuff can be scary. And so we need to study it more. We need to understand what would happen. Thank you. Um, yeah. Well, pretty much the same, um, as in people and seeing what they can do and seeing the imagination and the ingenuity of children, particularly, um, and my faith, um, very similarly. I, I, I often quote, um, and you won't be expecting this tonight, but a line from a Bollywood movie um, <laughs> that happens to be the best definition of, of Christian hope that I've ever come across. Um, in, and it's a Delhi taxi driver speaking to his family about his dream of finding a wife outside the international arrivals terminal in Delhi, as you go. And, and he says, it's a fact of future truth. And to me, that's, that's the best definition I've come across of, of biblical hope. Anyway, less Bollywood. Let's have some more questions. Um, yeah. Thank you for your uh, lecture. Um, how would you answer positively to the hyper-religious Christian who has a millennial, post-millennial dispensational perspective on the end of the world and everything's going to be better when Christ comes back? How do you answer that without uh, getting cross? <laughs> <laughs> Not speaking from personal experience, are you? <laughs> Thank you. And who, who's got the mic on this side? Any, any questions on this side? Yes, we had one in the second row. Yeah. Hi, Catherine. Thank you very much. Uh, there's a similar point that I was going to make. I mean, there are not many conservative Christians I've come across who really use their religion to oppose the science. There are a few do here. And for some of them, you said earlier that some people treat science as religion. They seem to treat religion as a science. Mm -hmm. I was, there's it's one interpretation. It's like a formula. Mm -hmm. You put your stuff in and, it, and only one answer comes out, not many possible answers, so uh, that's, that's my feeling. And it's something to do with the rigidity of their thinking. <coughs> Don't you can comment on that. Yes. Yeah. Go on. So those two questions fit together nicely. Mm. Uh, to, to answer a question such as, it's all going to disappear anyways and you know, Christ will fix it when he returns, to answer that question, I wouldn't answer it with the science. I would go to the Bible. And one of the things I love most about reading Paul's letters to the different churches is how little humans have changed in 2,000 years. In Thessalonians, right, there were many people who at that time believed that Christ's return was imminent, as in any day. 
And so they were quitting their jobs, laying around, just, you know, waiting for Christ to return. So Paul wrote to those people, and this is paraphrasing broadly, said, get off your rear, get a job, care for the widows and the poor, because we have work to do here and now. It doesn't matter if you think the world's going to end tomorrow or the next day, there is still something for you to be doing now. God does not call us to be passive. God calls us to be active in expressing his love to others. And so that's how I would answer. Even if you think the world might end next week, there are still things that we can be doing. There are still good works that God has prepared for us that we are able to walk in. Um, your question is one that I think many have tackled and we certainly cannot answer tonight. <laughs> We often take, we take what, whatever we feel supports our perspective. And what fascinates me is, well, I get a great deal of um, negative input from people who don't want to say that climate change is real. My husband, who is a pastor, gets a great deal of negative input from people who are firmly convinced that absolutely everything is predestined by God. The color of your car, the address of your house, and certainly your spouse and your job. It is fascinating because I think there's a strong similarity in the personalities that desire every little nuance of our life to be mapped out in advance with those who say that humans cannot possibly affect this planet. There's a desire for control. I want to control my life. I want to feel safe. I want to feel okay. And the fascinating thing is that is what God offers to us. Because can we control? planet? No. Can we control ourselves? Probably not even. We can't not control our circumstances. God offers us the comfort of not needing to feel like we're in control because he's in control. And so in a sense, I believe that many of our issues are a, a desire to build our own identity, have our own safety, have our own control. And in, ironically, in giving up, we are able to find peace. Giving up the feeling like I have to fix everything or I have to be in control of everything. And so it's interesting how those deep needs of the soul express themselves so often in objecting to everything from predestination to the reality of climate change. They all come out of a place of profound spiritual need. What are your thoughts on that? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, the whole. He's the theologian. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, and particularly when it comes to, to eschatology, to discussing uh, the end things, what will happen to the planet, uh, what God's going to do at the end, I, I think it's always in, important to help people realize that there have been a variety of Christian views over time, that what we call today millennialist, post-millennialist views are actually, they kind of coincided with the arrival of the Industrial Revolution, most of those attempts to uh, interpret the Bible in, in such a a specific way that through the history of Christianity you don't find those very much and I would encourage people to look at passages of, of scripture that really suggest we need to be maybe a bit more open about what God's future should be to acknowledge that the Bible points to both discontinuity and continuity in God's future plans so I haven't yet found anybody who can explain away what Romans 8 says about creation waiting to be set free from its bondage to decay. If they have a theology of it's all going to get burnt up and destroyed, then they need to be able to explain that. Or, you know, sometimes people who love to talk about the end times like the book of Revelation rather a lot. But have they really looked at Revelation chapter 11, verse 18, if I'm right, where God says, uh, I will destroy those who destroy the earth. Um, people maybe need to look a little bit more carefully and, and you know, if people want some further reading, there's a chapter in PlanetWise um, that they can have a look at. Um, there's also an excellent book by Tom Wright, N.T. Wright, called Surprised by Hope, uh, that has a lot of material about the end times and how we should think about those. So I'd encourage people to think again, but not to be confrontational, just to kind of tease away at the edges. And I would add to this too, you didn't bring up this issue, but when I was speaking at Wheaton College a number of years ago, I was invited there by a professor of geology. I didn't know what to expect. I'm a public school person. I grew up in the public school system. This was my first exposure to a Christian college. 
So I didn't really know how that was going to go down, so I showed up, I guest taught a couple of classes, and I quickly realized that all the faculty there in geology were 100% on board with the idea that the Earth is old, and Big Bang was real, and everything like that. So, so I was heading into the public lecture that night, feeling like, wow, this is great. And one of the geology professors pulled me aside and he said, are you going to show ice core data? Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with ice core data, that's data you get from these amazing ice cores that go miles down in Greenland and Antarctica, showing how temperature and carbon dioxide have gone up and down in sync with the orbital cycles for hundreds of thousands of years until now. Now, when they should be going down, they're going up. So I said, well, actually, thanks to my husband, I have prepared a plot of ice core data that only goes back 6,000 years. <laughs> now, there's no scientific reason to make that plot, but there's a very compelling reason to make it, which is the fact that, you know what, to agree that humans are changing climate, we only have to agree the Earth is 300 years old. And everybody agrees about that. So I said, oh no, I'm only showing the last 6,000 years. He said, whew, he said, because last year we had Sir John Houghton. You know Sir John Houghton? Yes. yes. He was, he was the inaugural chair of the Working Group 1 of the IPCC. He is also a person of faith. We actually both grew up in the Plymouth Brethren tradition, of all things. He said, last year we had Sir John Houghton. As soon as he slapped that ice core data up on the screen, he just lost half the audience. <laughs> so I think, I think there is a place for, for being sensitive to the fact that, you know what? The big deal here is not how and when the Earth came into being. We can agree that climate change is real and humans are responsible as long as we agree that the Earth is 300 years old. <laughs> and as far as I know, everybody does. I haven't yet met somebody who doesn't. So there are, I think the most important thing is to talk about things that we can agree on. And if somebody asks me, I will tell them honestly, I, my degree is in astrophysics, I studied cosmology, and I am amazed by how many cosmologists <coughs> turn from atheism or agnosticism to actually saying there must be something more because of their science. Surveys of scientists in the United States at top research universities by Lane Eklund, one of my favorite people. She's written a great book. You can find it on Amazon. Surveys have shown that 70% of scientists at top research universities in the U.S. who come from all over the world, these are, most, most of them are not even American, 70% view themselves as spiritual people. In other words, they believe there is something more than the science. 35% would explicitly say there's a God. So we can talk to people, I think, by focusing on, on what we have in common and what we can agree on. And we can often get much further down the road in that way. So. Now, we must allow some more questions. Um, let's have hands up so we see where the questioners are. And if we can have a mic going, maybe someone over on the, the far side over there. And someone over here. See who we can get the mic to first. Someone right in the middle over here. Yes. Hi. Um, do you think that capitalism is a fundamental uh, problem for solving climate change? And if so, how can we affect economic policy? Capitalism and economic Naomi policy. Naomi and I are both in Toronto. In fact, she lives a few blocks away from my sister. <laughs> if that's who you're thinking about. Yes. And over here. Yeah, it seems we've got more than just a climate crisis, but a sustainability crisis. So, insect populations are plummeting, we've taken most of the fish out of the sea, our soils are, are depleted. A lot of your solutions at the end were quite kind of technical fixes. Don't you think, you know, this is a Christian audience, don't you think we're going to have to make some significant sacrifices, especially us, the wealthiest people that have ever existed living in the West today? We, we are going to need to make, need to make a significant sacrifices. What do you think? So there are these websites that you can go to and you can enter all the different facts about your lifestyle and you can see how many planets we would need if everybody lived like me. My life is, is pretty conservative, considering where I live. We don't have public transportation, but I drive a plug-in car. We're pretty easy on the, on the meat. You know, I, I dry my, my clothes. I use the LED light bulbs. If everybody had my lifestyle, we'd need four planets. Yes, you're right. It is not just about climate. It's the fact that climate change is exacerbating all of these other host of issues that are caused by overconsumption, lack of equality, disproportionate resources. I just read a headline today that said that the richest 1% of people in the world now own 50% of the world's assets. 
We live in a world that is increasingly becoming divided between the have and have nots, and climate change is one of the exacerbators of this, as well as one of the symptoms. And that links to the economic question about capitalism and is, do we need a change of economic system? Is that what's going to solve this? Or is it, is it a change of the heart more that's going to solve this? Well, if you look around the world, you look at different countries that have different political systems and different economic systems as well. There's no perfect fix. Some people say, well, in the United States, if you could just overturn Citizens United, which treats corporations as people, that would fix it. If we could just get rid of capitalism, that could fix it. If we could just terraform Mars, that could fix it. Yes, I've heard people say that. One of them being Stephen Hawking. I was speaking at a conference with him this summer, and he said that, and I was sitting there in the front row going, what? <laughs> so my talk was coming up a bit later, and I was speaking with Martin Rees, who some of you may know, he's the Royal Astronomer. So I said, Martin, in between when they were taping up our computers, because it turns out we both have the same computer. Um, and I was okay if they, gave him, you know, if they gave me his. <laughs> but no. So while they were taping up our computers, I said, Martin, how do you feel about that? And he laughed, he said, Fixing climate change is a dawdle compared to terraforming ours. <laughs> so people say if only we could do X, we could fix climate change. But as a scientist, I know this. We don't have time for X. We do not have time. Do we need a radical revolution in the equality and the way that we distribute our resources around the world as a human and as a Christian? I say yes. Will we accomplish this within the time needed to fix climate change? As a scientist, I say no. We will only be able to put ourselves on a path to sustainability, which is the point you raised, which will in turn allow us to examine how we can, how we can change our world. We will only have the ability to do that, do that if we put the brakes on climate change, and we have to do that somehow within the system that we have. So that is why one of the organizations that I serve as a scientific advisor for is something called Citizens Climate Lobby. Um, I am not a political person, but I love Citizens Climate Lobby because they are completely apolitical. They will work with people on any side of the spectrum. And in the United States, there's people from CCL here in the, in the UK as well, and in Canada too. In the US, they have built, talk about miracles and hope, they have built a bipartisan climate solutions caucus in the US Congress, the most bitterly divided body of legislators in the entire world. I know you might think it's bad here, but trust me. <laughs> they have built a bipartisan climate solutions caucus that is only a year and a half old, and in a year and a half they have achieved 60 members. Now you might say, well, but hang on, surely there's more people who support climate action. Yes, but you're only allowed to join if you join with a de Democrat and a Republican at the same time. So they have 60 members, and they're doing that to get a critical mass of Republicans on the side of the Democrats to where they can actually get climate legislation passed. We have to somehow work within the system we have, as well as keeping the long-term view. Otherwise, we will not have the ability to meet our long-term goals. Thank you. I think we've got time for maybe just one more pair of questions. So. Maybe one more. There are several hands down towards the front here, Stephen, and somebody right at the back. The person at the back first. And, and while you're asking, let me just say that I, I, we release a new Global Weirding episode every other week on my Facebook page, and the weeks in between, I do a live Q&A. So if you're interested, we have people tuning in from the UK all the time. All you have to do is like my Facebook page, and you'll be notified of the next Q&A. So if you have a question we didn't get to, check out the Q&As. We usually get to about 50 to 80 questions per session in half an hour. I'm a fast talker. Wow. <laughs> so, Catherine, thank you very much for a very compelling talk. One of the arguments I've heard around climate change, which you expressed a bit, was that it is directly correlated to the increase in population. And some people have said that if you are responsible and passionate, about tackling the climate crisis, um, you should reduce the number of children that you have. Um, I'm interested to hear your view on that. Mm -hmm. Andy. Good question. 
Catherine, you're in a church with a largely Christian audience, and we are privileged in this country that most of the major denominations, if not all, have signed up, committed to taking action on climate change. Um, yet, from what you say, the science is pretty clear that we need to move much, much faster than we're doing. Do you think there's a particular role for the church? Um, you may not know the British church that well, but looking globally, do you think there's more that the churches could be doing than they're doing, and what would that be? Yes, great questions. Two very different questions. Population and family size and the role of the church. Let me get to that one and then this one, and then I want you to answer that one too. <laughs> oh. <laughs> All right. So one of the most frequent questions I get is, um, you know, is it just an overpopulation problem? And the answer is, it is not an overpopulation problem. It's a problem of too many people consuming too many of the resources. So is the answer to say, well, we shouldn't have children? and we're only allowed to have one child. I believe that the answer, and one of the top answers, I don't know if you've heard of a book called Drawdown. It's a really beautiful book, nice big pictures. It lists and ranks the top 100 solutions to climate change. And in, num in the, te the top 10, I actually had the author call me up and I was in the humiliating position of he made me guess every single one of the top 10. <laughs> I did not get them right, and he laughed every time I guessed wrong. <laughs> but don't take that, you know, don't take that personally. It's a great book, and in the top 10 is one of my absolute favorite things, and that's why I'm so glad you asked this question. One of the top 10 solutions to climate change worldwide is the education of women and girls in poor countries. Now you might say, how does that connect? Because there is a direct correlation between the level of education that a woman has, and we're talking just about you know, graduating from elementary, graduating from middle school, graduating from high school, there's a direct correlation between the amount of education a woman has and the lifespan of their children and the rate of infant mortality. The more education a woman has, the more likely her children are to survive infanthood. The more likely that she is to not have to have eight or ten children because she doesn't know how many of them are going to die. And she doesn't need that many of them because she's able to support her family. When we look, just compare countries based on their GDP, we see that there is a direct correlation between the ability of women to be educated and to hold a job and the number of children that we have. So rather than trying to be top down and forcing some punitive restrictions on thou shalt not have more than X children or child, why don't we do this in a positive way? Because who does not support educating women and girls? Who does not support allowing half the population on this planet to actually have a say in their own future? Let them decide how many children they want to have. And as we have seen from looking at our own countries, once we have the choice, we typically, more often than not, decide to have less children. So yes, I think that does play a role, but not in top-down enforcing, but rather in bottom-up encouraging, improving health, improving welfare, improving standard of living, improving education, improving ability to support your family. Those are the things we can improve. And I don't think anybody disagrees with that. Do you? Certainly not. No, I think so. <laughs> All right. So on to the second question, yeah. which you're going to have to remind me. What is it? It was <laughs> and Andy's question. Yes. Andy, do you want to put it again? I mean, I... Oh, no, just summarize. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, I will. Um, the role of the church oh, yes, yes, yes. In, right. in influencing in, in a country where the church is signed up, yes. but yet far more and far more radical action is needed. Yes. What is the role of the church? So you remember how I said, well, how do we talk about climate change? And you remember I said, we bond over shared values. We connect those values to a changing climate, and then we look for inspirational ways that we can work together to fix this problem. What more common shared values do we have than our faith? 85% of people in the entire world belong to some type of faith tradition, and that is what informs the majority of our values. If we really believed what it says in the Bible, we would be out front demanding climate action. Just as Wilberforce was, and other evangelicals were, during the end of slavery. They were out front, and the fascinating thing, as Jean-Francois Moucho has pointed out, who works for Russia, he is a historian who has studied the connections between slavery and fossil fuels. And he has looked at editorials and articles that were written back in the 1800s in England, in the early 1800s, and um, in the United States in the late 1800s. He has looked at the language people used 
to say that we keep, you know, we still need slavery. The analogies, even sometimes the very words and phrases they use, are identical to what we see people using to say we need to keep fossil fuels today. It's not so bad. It's good for us. Look how much it does for the economy. It would destroy the economy to take them away. We need a shift as radical today as that shift was 200 years ago when we weaned ourselves off a society powered by humans onto a society powered by fossil fuels. And just as people of faith led the way compelled by that faith, in the same way today, I think that we, as people of faith, should be leading the way as well. That is the most common, basic, essential, core, fundamental value that we have. And so, yes, I absolutely think the church has a role to play. Dave. <laughs> thank, you, thank you very much. And, of course, I do as well. And, by the way, if you didn't know who the questioner was there, Andy Atkins is um, CEO of Arosha UK. So, um, he's, he's my opposite man. And, and I could just play into this straight away by saying one of the best things that churches can do is get involved in Eco Church, which is a, a brilliant program, only launched in January last year, and more than 700 UK churches have signed up to that already. So it, it's a really good way, and we found this in a very multiracial, ordinary church in West London, great way of engaging people who didn't think they could do anything positive, but they can get engaged through that. So that's, that's one of a number of really good solutions. But we're going to have to stop the public discussion there because nine o'clock has gone and I'm going to turn into a pumpkin very soon. <laughs> now, I just want to say thank you, Catherine. Thank you for a huge amount of work. Thank you. And if you don't mind, I'm just going to pray for Catherine as we finish our meeting this evening. Lord, thank you for our sister in Christ here, Catherine. Thank you for the ministry that you have called her to as a scientist, as a physicist, and as a communicator with people around the world about climate change. Lord, I believe that you have put her in this place, like Esther in the Bible, for such a time as this. And Lord, we pray for your protection on her, particularly from the attacks that she receives for doing this work. Lord, may she continue to know that she need have no fear, that fear does not come from you. Lord, may you continue to strengthen her. And Lord, we pray that you would change the tide of public opinion, not just in Texas, not just in the United States, but across the world in this area. And change not just opinion, but change people's hearts so that they will respond and be willing to care for their neighbor, to care for your creation, to recognize that this is your world, Lord. So, Lord, please bless Catherine, bless her in her remaining time here in the UK and as she travels back to the US. And bless each of us as we go home. And may we take action on the basis of what we've heard tonight. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all.